The aim of these films is to provide an update for the skill of indwelling urinary catheterisation. There are three films in these series. The first one is about what you need to think about before you insert the catheter. The second one is about the procedure. And the third one is what you need to do after the catheterisation. The expectation is that a full day's catheter training and competency has been completed previously. As this is a refresher of the skill, we are expecting that you understand the relevant anatomy and physiology. We will not be covering this in detail. The Trust advises that indwelling urinary catheters are only inserted after other methods of management have been considered. Long-term catheterisation should be considered a last resort in the treatment of bladder dysfunction. Some of the indications for catheterisation are as follows. To relieve acute or chronic urinary retention, preoperatively or for postoperative drainage, to measure accurate urine output, to determine a post-void residual volume, to enable the bladder function test to be, to, to be performed or as a last resort for unmanageable urinary incontinence. Before you start, ensure that you are familiar with the Gloucestershire Health and Care Urinary Catheterisation Policy. There are a number of action cards at the back of the policy to support with insertion, changing and removal of catheters, as well as guidance on drainage systems, incrustation, specimens and bladder scanning. It's vital that you work within your level of competence at all times. When considering alternative methods of management, remember intermittent catheterisation. Studies suggest that clean, intermittent catheterisation is the safest method of emptying the bladder, so it may be more appropriate than an indwelling catheter. The benefits of intermittent catheterisation include promoting greater independence, reducing urinary tract infections, maintains urethral closure, allows more normal bladder function, freedom for sexuality and positive body image, but for intermittent self-catheterisation to be successful, individuals need to have sufficient dexterity, they need to be motivated and have capacity. These considerations will form part of your assessment. A full patient assessment must be completed prior to considering catheterisation. A balanced decision should be made considering the benefits and risks of the procedure. There are a number of associated risks with catheterisation and they include pain or discomfort of the procedure, injury to the urethra or prostate, urethral stricture caused by trauma or repeated or long-term catheterisation, injury to the bladder, bleeding, urinary tract infections, bladder spasm or bladder stones from long-term indwelling catheter placement. There are certain times when advice should be sought before catheterisation. These include recent urological surgery, so that's within the last month, trauma to the abdomen, pelvis or urethra, carcinoma of the urinary tract, haematuria, abnormal urethral discharge, previous difficulties with catheterisation, congenital abnormalities of the penis and urethra, or acute retention. There are further guidance on acute retention within the catheterisation policy. If the patient has been assessed as needing an indwelling catheter, informed consent needs to be obtained. The individual should be informed of the reason for the procedure, its associated risks and benefits, and a decision must include other options such as alternative methods of bladder management. The person's details should be checked and don't forget to check for allergies including whether a patient is allergic to latex. Only catheters made from polyvinyl chloride and 100% silicone are free from latex. So there's certain equipment that you will need. You'll need a dressing trolley or a clean area if you're in the patient's own home. You'll need Clonel wipes to clean that area, covering for the bed, a catheter pack. And if you are using anaesthetic lubricant gel, it must be prescribed or administered from the appropriate medication protocol. The patient should be socially clean before the procedure is commenced. The patient should be offered a chaperone and dignity must be maintained at all times. Discuss with the patient that they will need to lie on their back with their knees bent and hip flexed with their feet about 60 centimetres apart. Make sure you've got some kind of protection on the bed. There are a number of circumstances when the procedure should be abandoned. 
if the catheter no will not pass with gentle pressure, if bleeding occurs, or if the procedure is unusually painful. Only have two attempts at the procedure. After this, seek advice. This section is now complete, so you're ready to go on to the next film, the insertion of a catheter. This video looks at the procedure of male adult catheterization. I've explained the procedure to the patient and explained the risks and the benefits and obtained their informed consent. I've assisted them to get undressed from the waist down and got them comfortable on the bed. At this point, I'm going to go and wash my hands and then prepare my equipment. I'm washing my hands for the designated 30 seconds and then I'm going to clean my dressing trolley with a Cornell wipe. And I'm going to allow that to air dry. My catheter pack um, has got all the information that you need. It has the size of the catheter, the gauge of the catheter, and look for the standard length catheter, which is a male catheterization, irrespective if you're catheterizing a male or a female. Generally speaking, females tend to be a 12 to a 14 gauge catheter, males uh, a 14 to a 16. Also be aware of the expiry date on the uh, catheter pack and on the back of the catheter pack you have a couple of stickies um, which has got, have got the reference number, the lot number and the expiry date for the information for documentation afterwards. You're going to open your catheter pack on your surface. Also be aware that um, the catheter packs do have some sterile gloves in there, but they tend to be a medium. So if you have got larger hands, uh, then you may need to get the appropriate size sterile gloves as well. So you're going to open your sterile pack. And then you're going to uncover your patient. Trying to maintain as much dignity as you possibly can and ask them just to bring their heels up, okay, to be in that best position. You can then take your towel, which is in the pack, and just position the towel just underneath. Okay, just to offer some protection. I now need to wash my hands uh, before donning the sterile gloves. And I'll do this for the dozen 30 seconds. Okay, so I'll now don my sterile gloves. So in the pack you have the two pairs of sterile gloves, you have a sterile towel that will go in there just before catheterization, just to keep a sterile field. You have some gauze, you have an empty syringe which will allow you to deflate the balloon of the existing catheter if one's in situ. You have two syringes of sterile water for cleaning purposes. You have a 10ml syringe of sterile water to inflate the new balloon and you have some um, lubricant gel there to allow passage of the catheter. Be aware if you are using an anaesthetic lubricant then that will need to be prescribed. So at this point if you take one of your gauzes and open it up you can then use this gauze around the penis to allow you to handle the penis but maintain your sterility. Remember this is an uh, aseptic non-touch technique. All the procedure is sterile so you've got to maintain that sterility. You would then put some of your sterile water on the gauze
the patient has got a foreskin, you would need to retract this at this point, okay, having cleaned the area first. But please be aware that if you are, are retracting the foreskin, if there is a foreskin, it will need to be returned because of the risk of paraphimosis. Okay, so I've done my first clean, and you'll notice that I'll start at the meatus, at the entry of the, the urethra, I do one sweep around and then I dispose of that. Once I've cleaned the area, I then get my lubricant gel. Warn the patient that this can be a little bit cold and a little bit uncomfortable. You insert the, cap the syringe into the urethra and just very gently instill the gel. If you are using an anaesthetic, please be aware that you will need to, to leave it for three to five minutes just to allow it to start working. At this point, you would then go and remove your sterile gloves and wash your hands. So I've now washed my hands for a further 30 seconds and donned my second pair of sterile gloves. I will then put a fresh gauze swab around the penis just so I can uh, manipulate it around before putting on my sterile towel to maintain my sterile field. Underneath um, your catheter pack you'll see that you have a fixator uh, device and you have your catheter itself. You'll notice that the catheter has got its catheter bag attached, okay, and there's a red um, tape on there. That signifies that actually the catheter bag does not need changing for approximately two weeks, uh, and you can put the change date on there. If this wasn't on there, then these bags get changed on a weekly basis. So once you've identified that, we're going to insert the catheter itself. You'll see that there's perforations along the length of the catheter, just to make sure that you do maintain a non-touch technique. You will need to lift the penis 90 degrees and gently insert the catheter. When you get to some resistance around where the prostate is, it might be a good idea to just get your patient to cough and that seems to relax the prostate to allow you to um, just push it into the bladder. When you start getting some urine in the catheter bag, then you can push it in for a further two centimeters um, and then proceed, but it's always a good idea a little bit safer to make sure that you push it all the way up to the bifid okay and that ensures that you're well in the catheter you can then get your sterile water and gently inflate your balloon if you do find that you are getting some resistance and you haven't pushed it all the way in then at this point just stop push it in for a further two centimetres and then retry. Okay, make sure that you use all the 10 mils and then gently pull back until you get some resistance. And the procedure's done. At this point, you'll need to use your last bit of gauze just to clean around the area. If you have retracted the foreskin for this procedure, at this point you will need to um, put it back into position. Be aware of the risk of paraphimosis.
When applying the fixation device, you'll see that there's a little perforation on there. You can remove this. Now this needs uh, to be on the patient's leg. Okay, ideally it needs to be on the top of their leg so there's no chaffing when you're walking. Simply gently apply it to the top of the leg. Make sure that there's not any tension on the catheter. Okay. Attach it on there. You've also got some ties, and when doing the ties, make sure that you put the ties underneath the tube on the top part because you do not want to occlude the, the tube um, because that is going to cause a problem with the flow of urine into the bag. and then you can repeat it on the lower one as well. Okay, and that concludes the video for the male catheterization. So the catheter is now in place, we're just gonna talk about what you need to do following the procedure. You need to make sure that you document all the care given and all patients when they're discharged from hospital must be referred to their community nursing service and given a catheter passport. The documentation that you complete needs to include informed consent, any allergies were identified, the reason for catheterisation, so whether it was a catheter change or the ongoing need for the catheter, the procedure details so that you used aseptic non-touch technique, something about the insertion, was it an easy or a difficult insertion, were there any abnormalities seen? The product details, so most catheter packs come with a sticker which contains the material, the size, the lot number, expiry date and balloon size, so just make sure you document all of that. Record the amount and the colour of urine drained, your choice and use of devices, for example a standard bag or a urometer, and any follow-up arrangements that you've made including date of the next change. Don't forget to date, time, signature or your electronic record will do this. So the catheter passport is a patient held document that can be useful for the patient and the clinician looking after the catheter. So there's information in there for the patient on catheter care and tips on living with a catheter. There's information on prevent prevention of infection including hand hygiene and the importance of keeping hydrated there's a place there where you can record the dates where the catheter is inserted and as the document stays with the patient, hopefully that will move around um, services with the patient. There's, you're able to record urinary tract infections and catheter supplies in there. There's information on troubleshooting and how to seek help. Do remember that urinary catheters are a common source of infection. We shouldn't underestimate the risk of these invasive devices and how infections can easily escalate and patients deteriorate. Clinical observations should be undertaken as per your local policy. You have now completed the catheter update. Ensure you work within your level of competence at all times and seek support from your clinical area as required. The policy and further information on Clinical Skills Net can be found on the intranet.